Yeah. This is on purpose. I was like, it says max spot right here.
Thanks, Pete. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Kumarajan from uh, Advanced Micro Micro Devices, and he will try to persuade you to switch to GPUs. So I think uh, ARM cores are, uh, I think they play a very interesting role because they have like really simple cores. Yeah. So that's why they consume really low power. So I think when it comes to mobile devices, they have a, they're probably going to have a big say in the marketplace. So that seems to be their uh, forte. So far, it's probably going to go ahead in the future. Uh, so and I think recently our competitors, NVIDIA, teamed up with ARM, I guess, to come up with their more tablet-like devices, so yeah. that's gonna, I think that's going to create an interesting marketplace. If they're making simple pipelines, and you have a more complex pipeline, all of a sudden, if they're able to put more cores on their die, can they outbeat you by keeping a simpler pipeline? So it, uh, actually, uh, the whole thing comes down to what kind of applications you want to run. But if you want to run uh, simple applications, uh, like word processing or just stuff like that, then if you have more cores, you basically can run more, more number of these in parallel. Like you run more browsers in parallel, more tabs in the browser in parallel, and it works great. But when you talk about uh, any kind of uh, application that you probably use, you know, like comments. Like if you want to do uh, a simple example is GCC. If you want to run your, to compile your program using GCC or something, or do your development on that. So those kinds of things. Uh, these complex cores are much more capable compared to these simpler cores. So it will be like, um, I don't know, probably, I'm not sure it's going to be an order of magnitude faster, but it's going to be pretty close. So uh, well, with GCC, I, don't, I, I wouldn't see like a floating point operations being done. But what, what type of operations are you talking about that are more? Well, I think there are two kinds of operations that are both going to be faster when you talk, you talk about complex cores. One is integer operations involved, like memory and things like, you know, if they have a lot of branches, like, you know, a lot of control flow in their programs, then you would need uh, sophisticated uh, pipelines to be able to not stall when it sees these kinds yeah. of behaviors. For those kinds of things, uh, these kinds of processes are really good. Uh, the x86, like AMD and Intel processors. On the other side of things, if you have, um, uh, like, floating point operation, what you're talking about, that, again, comes down to uh, some of these uh, applications like, you know, I don't know, uh, any kind of game processing or physics and these kinds of things. So th they would need a lot of floating point units and that's again where these kind of really little more complex cores play a big role. I think we've covered parts of that in the yeah. talk. So. Yeah. I'm sorry, one more follow-up. Oh, it sure. doesn't matter. Is that okay? Uh, oh, sure. I, I, have you ever heard of uh, Hera VM where it takes uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, cores and uh, uh, with uh, directives in the Java code, it actually can uh, just in time compile per core for heterogeneous cores. Oh, uh, no, actually, that's, a, that's, that's actually very interesting because that's very related to what the research that I'm doing, but we do it at a, at a different, um, like something, some of the language based more, more like on C rather yeah. than Java. So uh, 
I think that's interesting. Heterovium, you said? Yeah, yeah, it's Hera. H-E-R-A-V-M. Oh, Hera-V-M. Yeah. Uh, who's yeah. working on it? Uh, it was a research project by, uh, I forgot, forgot his name. I can, I mean, if you search for it on, on oh, okay, yeah, 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 you'll be able to find it. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Because it, it becomes harder for a programmer to program, you know what I mean, for, okay, how am I going to get all these gains out of, right. you know? Yeah, I think you'll, you'll see a lot of those uh, suggestions and uh, things in the talk today, too. I think, the, uh, I think I'll cover those parts a little bit, and I think you can chime in there and uh, have more questions at that point, and I think we can talk more. So that's, yeah, that's good. So I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, they're probably walking. Uh, so so uh, the topic today I'm going to talk about is uh, CPU versus GPU when, uh, when their words collide. So it's kind of fun, I guess. So my name is Giant, and uh, I work with AMD right now. And But one thing I want to add as a disclaimer right off before I start the talk is that these are all my own personal views and nothing to do with AMD. So if you quote me on quote me on AMD, I might get fired. So I'm just going <laughs> to <laughs> these are just my views. Okay. So so I guess before I I wasn't sure what the background of the people around is because one of the things that I heard was there'll be a lot of freshmen and others who have probably just started programming. So there'll be a couple of slides which are probably a little very basic. So uh, I apologize for those who already are very well versed in the field. But anyway, so what are CPUs and GPUs? So CPUs are essentially central processing units. So basically when you write a program and they get decomposed into instructions at some point, like add and subtract and so on, that finally execute on your computers, uh, the brain that actually carries out all these instructions on your, uh, on, your on your computer, whether it's a laptop or desktop or whatever it is, are, uh, is essentially what your uh, CPU is all about. Uh, so examples of uh, some of the manufacturers of CPUs are AMD, uh, Intel and uh, and so on. I'm sure you've heard, heard these names before. And on the other side, there are these graphics processing units. So what are graphics processing units? Those these are basically just a, a specialized processor. What it does is it tries to offload the the task of uh, you know like showing off graphics on your uh, desktop or laptop onto a, uh, the CPU offloads it off into a separate device, and that device is what is called a graphics processing unit or a GPU. Uh, some of the examples of uh, GPUs are AMD, again, uh, has a GPU. It's uh, ATI used to be the GPU, and AMD acquired this company. So it's uh, officially, when I refer to ATI somewhere in the talk, it's going to be AMD GPU. And NVIDIA is one more example. <coughs> Intel has a lot of uh, graphics process as well. So with this in mind, so what are the main uh, goals of this talk? So I think I mainly, mainly, uh, I mainly wanted to give you guys a flavor of how the CPU and GPU things are evolving in the industry. And uh, show uh, show you what are the interesting trends that have happened before, and what's going to happen probably in the next few years, so that you can start thinking about this area a little more. And then uh, one of the interesting things which we, uh, was, uh, he brought it up out here uh, in terms of programming them is the next big challenge for a lot of these uh, uh, these types of devices. So I'm just going to touch upon them, and then I guess you guys should go and read up more if you are interested in that. And then uh, the hope is that at the end of the day, I'll get you more excited about this whole. Area, the whole area of computing, so that you can dig it up in your uh, grad school or uh, job or whatever it is that you go, go for next. So the outline is I'm just going to talk about the evolution of CPUs over the past few years. It's going to be a brief one. Don't, don't doze off. Then the next one is GPU, and then uh, how uh, GPU and CPU are kind of converging, and then what are the interesting challenges and opportunities in this area moving forward. So uh, I guess. Uh, whoever, anyone, anyone here has taken uh, architecture class at any point knows these, these like simple pipelines. Uh, Paul, how many of you are familiar with uh, pipelines? And oh, okay, great, sizable number of you. So it's like a fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back is like a typical one that you study at sc in school, which is essentially a uh, you know like when you bre break down your program, we talked about it in instructions, like an add, for example, you need to fetch this instruction from memory and execute, uh, decode it, and then execute it. And then you, the results are written back to memory, and, and so on. So these are the different stages of a typical execution of a pipeline. So uh, for brevity, I'm just going to put it as FTEMW out here as these different stages. So you probably have studied about these pipelining effects, where the idea of breaking it down into stages is that you can actually, at the end of the day, while you're fetching one instruction, you can be decoding the other instruction in, uh, in parallel out here. So uh, if, if it's a five-stage pipeline, at the end of the day, you probably have like 
you know, like these five stages happening in parallel for different instructions. Like you have an add going in parallel with a subtract, with, with, a, with a memory instruction like a load and so on. So this is like a high level picture of what you guys have probably studied in, in school. So when you look at it in the real world, it comes out to be something more like this. So uh, this is like a, one of the modern CPUs from AMD, it's about <coughs> four. Uh, so actually there's, there's this fetch stage out here, then there is this decode stage, then this, uh, these are the execute stages, which are like the floating point execution and uh, integer execution units. And then there is this uh, uh, memory stage where you potentially write it back to the decache and so on. And then there are these, there's this write back phase pretty much sort of encompassed up there. So just to give you a feel, this is what you'll probably see in the industry. And there is a lot of these complicated units, but the basic principles are extremely uh, simple and same. So this would give you a good uh, feel for uh, what you should do like, if you're in the industry. Um, there are a lot of other units here, like branch prediction and so on, which I won't touch upon in this uh, talk. So they're all just, just remember that it's a pretty complicated piece of software when you talk about these AMD CPUs and uh, Intel CPUs and so on. So, uh, so this is like kind of the early evolution of the CPU curve. Uh, so what happened was that uh, most of the complexity went into how to make these cores you know, faster and faster every generation. So one, there are two things that, uh, probably many things that led to these things, but I'll just talk about two important aspects of it. One is that it became, I noticed that every generation, these cores got more and more complicated. So these fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back stage that you saw was probably the very initial uh, pipeline that kind of came out. With time, they became more and more complicated, and now in these chips, they have all these, as you saw in the previous slide, you have branch predictors, you have multiple stages happening in parallel and whatnot. So, uh, so that's one of one trend that has happened. The second one is out here in this figure that I've shown in terms of frequencies. Uh, you don't need to know the exact numbers, but I guess it gives you a rough picture out here. Uh, both AMD and Intel, the wars were mainly between these two big companies where to see who could uh, produce like, you know, uh, a faster chip in terms of you know, higher clock frequency. So basically, you, you must have heard of like two gigahertz processor versus 2.5 or three gigahertz processor and so on. The idea, is to see, uh, the idea was that you take the same application and if you run it on uh, a processor that has higher clock frequency, hopefully it'll run much faster because it's kind of chugging on these instructions at a much faster rate. So uh, over a period of time, so as, as you can see around until 2005, that was kind of the, well, 2004, 2005, that was a trend where they were trying to increase the uh, processing speed. So you've heard of probably even three gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz processors that kind of came out. So the, the main problem that happened with this was that along with the frequency, the power went up quite drastically in all these systems. And so if you actually continue down this path of increasing the frequency, one thing they realized was it would lead to something like this, which is <laughs> just probably what uh, you don't want to happen. So that's the time that people decided, OK, fine, it's now important to now stop these wars and talk about more at the granularity of what people want. Like if people want to run multiple applications at the same time, they don't care about whether each application is running fast. They probably care about whether these applications are running in parallel very well and so on. So that's when that's what led to this um, I would call it one of the fundamental transformations of the whole CPU world, which is where you came up with these, like, you know, instead of having just one core out here, actually there are like two cores sitting next to each other on the same chip. So then, uh, so in 2006, around that it came out, and then in 2008 you had four, nine, about six, 2010 about eight, and what next? So I think this is a question mark, uh, I think which we'll probably talk about a little bit later, but it's not related exactly to the CPUs. But so this is the this has been the general trend at, of uh, evolution of uh, single core to multi core uh, processors on the CPU side. So with this, let's just hit upon what on the GPU side how things are are playing out. Uh, so on the GPU side, over the last twenty to thirty years, if you look at it, there was initially it was simple like wireframe rendering kind of uh, you know processors that were just doing some kind of wireframe rendering, and then with time they started having these you know, like shading, depth buffering, and vertex lighting, and so on. So I'm not sure if it's very clear, but if you see uh, in this figure, you can actually see its shadow, and then you know, some parts are more uh, have more light than the other parts, and so on. So it's basically these kinds of uh, effects that were added in, these, uh, at the, in this time frame. And then uh, they had, you can see in the next phase, that was more like these textures. You can actually see these objects with textures. Here it's pretty plain. Here they have textures. And then this is where an interesting phase that started coming out in that 
uh, until now, there were these specific units on this uh, GPU, on, on the graphics processors, which was actually uh, doing these respective jobs of you know, doing the uh, vertex processing or pixel processing and so on. But at this point in time, they started having uh, these things where they could actually program them to actually do uh, any kind of shading. So it, it, it transformed from a fixed function unit, as we call it, into a more programmable processor at this stage. And uh, moving forward, so, in, so this whole gra GPU, instead of viewing it as a purely a graphics machine, it started being used, uh, viewed as a parallel computing machine. So that's one of the big transformations that happened in 2000. So this is, again, a simple uh, architecture of the GPU core. I'm not going to go into details or anything out here. I just want to mention a few couple of quick things here that here, as you can see, the pipeline kind of out here, like get the input, do some rasterization, and produce the output, and so on is a typical uh, a graphics pipeline where you take, where you have to render something on your screen. And these are the cores that actually do all the computation for each pixel. You need to do something to put it up on, the, on your laptop or your desktop. So these are the cores that actually do it. So these became, uh, these are the units that are getting uh, more and more programmable. So these are the ones that actually have your heart of your computation. And so you can actually program them instead of doing graphics things to do other stuff. So this is where I want to introduce uh, Actually, I think it's easier to view this from the architecture point of view, and then I'll use a term called uh, GPGPU beyond that. So, uh, so we saw for CPU, for example, for a four-core processor, you have like these four cores, right? And, and correspondingly, if you look at a GPU, you can think of it as having, uh, you know, like uh, here I have like 14 multiprocessors, where each of them have 32 cores. So you imagine these cores are actually heavyweight cores that we talked about. They have like you know, all kinds of uh, branch prediction unit and extraneous, uh, you know, complex cores. The, the idea of going to the GPU was because all it needs to do is simple processing uh, for graphics rendering purposes. The hope was that these simple, uh, these simple pipelines that are there, which you can basically each, uh, you can put them out here. So there are like you replicate them. And so you have like simple pipelines, but many of them that are happening in parallel. So that's the way to, if you view uh, GPUs that way, then it becomes essentially a multiprocessor for actually doing a lot of things in parallel at the same time. So this is the time I want to introduce this term called GPGPU, uh, which is general purpose com computation on GPUs. So until now, graphics processor was more, more like a uh, graphics rendering engine, but now it's more uh, becoming a more and more a general purpose processor for running some uh, high performance kind of computing applications. So these are some of the, uh, just to give you, uh, this is just a slide to give you a fair idea as to what uh, what the differential in performance between these two kinds of devices because of these architectures, ar architecture decisions are. So on the y-axis here, you see flops, which is number of floating point instructions that are performed per second. And this is for, a different, uh, for different years. This has been the growth. As you can see, the, uh, the GPU as and around 2007 was about 300 something gigaflops, whereas CPUs correspondingly was about 50 gigaflops. If you look at the numbers right now, it's actually GPUs are over, uh, tera, over teraflops right now. It's like two teraflop chips you can easily get. Whereas uh, CPUs, because of their multi-core, <coughs> it's actually going slightly higher as well. And you, you'll probably see a little more extension out here. There's one more aspect of the CPU I didn't talk about, which I don't want to get into too much. But it's like the CPUs also have this other specialized unit called SAC units. I don't know if you're familiar with it. So these are like your floating point units, vector units, that, that where, which enables you to run, uh, you know, like uh, some small, uh, small length vector unit, vector things in parallel. So that also, that width out there is basically increasing. So you're basically putting more and more functional units within a core as well. That's one more trend G, uh, CPU is uh, seeing. So both these together would contribute this good to go a little higher, uh, faster, but still this differential is going to be still maintained because that's the way graphics chips are built, and it's every year that they are built in, uh, you know, like for more and more performance. Um, so I think this is a time I'd like to show, if possible, a uh, demo as to where graphics has come to right now. So this is just showing the the uh, uh, the details as to which the graphics can actually render right now. Is that real-time rendering? It's, it's real not rendering right now. No. Yeah, it goes real-time when it goes down in the demo, yes. <laughs> not in this uh, mighty fun. So, 
So basically what you see is that whatever is in focus is actually you know, given a lot of attention and then the rest of it is kind of blurred out. Um, this is the ladybug. <laughs> Yeah, so I think this is the this kind of area where they're trying to do this. Uh, it's called depth of field, where depending on the depth, they want to have different showcase different aspects of it. So uh, this is one more active area of work on the graphics side. <laughs> so I had to have it for a little bit. Yeah, the lighting difference is amazing as you can see out here. I think that one of the hardest parts to actually uh, do it right is the hair. Because it's like moves everywhere. So here they have just a couple of them out here. Okay, so uh, basically what you saw was uh, high definition graphics rendering and one of the directions uh, that it's all moving to uh, next is, you know, you want or dynamics, as in, you know, you want to bring more and more uh, realism to this whole, uh, the whole aspect of rendering. And that would mean that it's not just going to be what it is right now, it's going to be like a lot of physical phenomena that needs to be integrated with the rest of the things. Like, let's say if the car here is going, I don't know, if it's going to run on water there, how the splashing happens, what are the effects, where does the water f uh, fly from there, and so on. So that's becoming the new big thing, and those kinds of things actually, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, is that th those kinds of things are getting offloaded off the GPU to do it in a much faster manner compared to the CPU. Um, so this is uh, one more side which, uh, of the uh, GPGPU thing, uh, which is interesting to note, is is like it's being used in uh, protein folding uh, kind of simulations. So this is the work that's being done at uh, Stanford right now, for example, where they're trying to figure out uh, how to simulate the whole protein folding. The idea is that if you can find out proteins that are not folded properly, the misfolded basically, you can uh, you can get uh, you can basically identify Alzheimer's and then you can identify the kind of drugs that would actually probably go and you know like which structures it's going to go and attach to. So you would build the corresponding drug based on how you would simulate the effects and so on. So uh, the interesting thing, though, uh, to note here is that uh, if you run this application on the GPU, because it's, it's a, this is essentially a molecular dynamics problem wherein you have these molecules that collide with each other and then move away and stuff like that. So it's an n-body problem. And these kinds of problems are actually uh, embarrassingly parallel. So they, have, uh, so they are ideally suited for the GPU. So when you run these kinds of applications on the GPU or the CPU today, it's about, uh, I think this was a few years back, but anyway, so it's probably a similar ratio, a little better right now for the GPU. It's about 40x faster. So given that it's 40 times faster, uh, the thing that you could actually do it in like three years in a typical simulation framework, you can actually do it now in a month. And this is probably going to get even better in the future. And so uh, the whole GPU-GPU computing on these, for these kinds of things has been a big boom. Uh, the other example of applications are uh, face recognition kind of a thing, which I guess a lot of you are uh, playing around with Facebook and all that stuff. So it, right now, it's you know the CPU can do a little bit of face recognition, but I guess if you want uh, to, you know, like recognize with thousands and thousands of pictures and within a matter of few seconds and whatnot, uh, uh, GPUs are probably a better better place to do it. So there are actually. So even today, while I speak, there are like algorithms being developed as to how to do deep recognition on the GPU as compared to the CPU. Um, this is one more example of this physical phenomena that I told about. Where and here you see like a rolling pin, uh, sorry, a rolling ball <laughs> that actually goes and uh, you know, get displaces all these pins, so that the effect as to where exactly it goes and so on. It's uh, it's again, it's a lot of physical phenomena that needs to be modeled. And again, GPUs here are probably going to be the right place to do a lot of these things. So uh, now that I've 
kind of motivated what the GP GPU model is and what kind of things would probably fit into that. Uh, one of the things that I have to step back and tell you again is that it's, even though it looks cool, it's the programming them is a nightmare. So you need to, yeah, that big a nightmare. Yeah, so you need to uh, figure out, uh, that it's a processor that is meant for graphics to begin with and you're trying to somehow use it for this multi-processor, uh, multi, uh, basically multi-processor. And, and so that, uh, so if you're gonna write a program today that you run on your uh, laptop with in a CPU, it'll, if you try to run it on the GPU, nothing is gonna happen, nothing's gonna come out of it because it's not meant to give you anything. Uh, because it's a single core there, as you, can, as, you, as you saw earlier, is like a simplistic core compared to the CPU core. So it'll probably perform worse. So the idea is therefore to, uh, to from the very beginning, start thinking about structuring your application in parallel. And that's why I guess your parallel processing classes here is going to be something that should, is, is get, getting pushed, pushed up higher and higher to like probably even the first year right now because this is becoming the fundamental building block for the future processors. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, a simple example of uh, how a programming model is and so on. So it, I'm not going into too many details, just to give you a flavor. So some of the interesting GPGPU languages uh, are OpenCL and CUDA. OpenCL is actually uh, uh, one of the industry standard right now. It started off a couple of years back and it's being accepted as a norm in, uh, for many of these companies. And CUDA was started by NVIDIA a few years back. They were the initial, uh, one of the initial people that started off this whole GPGPU computing efforts. So the idea is that uh, you, you declare something called a domain. A domain is like an n-dimensional computation uh, you know, like an array, for example. You, let's say you have a matrix. It's a two-dimensional, uh, two, it's a two-dimensional uh, set of no, set of elements. So, it's, in that case, it's a two-dimensional computation domain. And on each element, let's say you want to perform some operation. So, and you want to define that operation using a computation kernel. Like, you know, for that one element, I want to take a sine of it, cosine of it, take a log of it, and so on, and do what not for it, and uh, you know, uh, and perform all kinds of uh, uh, operations which take a long time on the CPU. So, uh, so to execute a kernel at each point, so in, uh, that's where you know, like GPGP languages kind of come into play, and they tell you, okay, so instead of structuring your application this way here, which is a, you know, have a simple application where all it does is, uh, it for uh, it it, gen it takes in like two arrays A and B, which is one dimension, multiplies them, and puts it in, th in a third array C. So instead of doing it this way, which you would do it in a, a typical CPU, you would actually need to structure it this way, wherein um, you would actually say, okay, this is a computation kernel that you need to need to parallelize, and then uh, so in should, uh, and then each so on each element, this is what is going to happen. So each element is going to go in; it's going to get its own global ID. It's, got, it's essentially its its position in that whole uh, uh, array, and then it's going to say, okay, this is my position. So b given this is my position, <coughs> if I'm going to take in these corresponding elements from these arrays, multiply them, and put them in the final uh, in the array C. So if as long as all, all these elements are doing it in parallel, so you can imagine instead of doing it like, instead of taking n times basically out here, it takes like order one time out here because it does it immediately. So I guess this is the high level picture of how you would write an application in like an open CL, the corresponding kernel. Um, I think at this point I want to use what's called the execution model of the whole process. So how does it actually work? So the CPU, right, in this case, like, decides that, oh, okay, I want to take this kernel, which is essentially the compute kernel, and I want to run it on the GPU. So what I'm supposed to do is to actually send it off over this bus interface, okay, which is called PCIe, uh, to this GPU device. Uh, the GPU device, in turn, gets the data and the instructions as to what to do with this uh, piece of computation. And what it does is, it, and as you know, as I talked about earlier, these cores are actually massively parallel uh, uh, you know, set of, set of uh, functional units. So uh, what happens is they get executed <coughs> out there and then the final result is actually sent back over the PCI uh, to the CPU memory and the CPU gets it back from there. <coughs> so this is like the slow. Uh, so this is, it's important to note, note the slow because it's, it kind of gives you the flavor of how uh, uh, the, I would say the driver application corresponding to that would be written. Like right now what you saw was a kernel which needs to be offloaded, right? So the, it's just that is one part of the whole program. The other part of the program is all about how you actually package it into this, these data buffers. How do you actually send it to the device? How does it get uh, computed and comes back? So it's basically an accelerator kind of an approach. 
so next, let me move on to. Um, okay, I think given that I have. To, okay, I want to talk about two things. I'm not sure. I'll. I think I'll probably skip these two slides out here. Which okay. So let me just mention it briefly, though. So if you have, uh, so let's say you have the CPU and GPU right now. We know they are two different ends on the spectrum, right? One of them is a highly sequential kind of processor. The other side is a highly parallel kind of processor. So in the industry, they felt okay. There are different approaches by which we can try and put them together. One approach is to try and build a hybrid processor that has you know both components to it. Like try why not build just one processor that can do both CPU and GPU? So that's what that's the approach that Intel took uh, in the, what's called the Larabee. And uh, uh, for good reasons, I'm not going to go too much into detail with all this. All let's say, uh, all I'm going to say is that it, it kind of failed that approach uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the main things was that it, along with the benefits that it came with having being able to do both at the same time, it also came with all the all the drawbacks, so to speak, of these two approaches. So I don't want to diss Intel out here. So I just want to move on to something uh, which is. Uh, uh, which is a little more interesting as to so the uh, so what happened at the end of the day was they said okay instead of trying to mix the two into just one architecture let's try to have both these architectures around at the same time but in, but let's let the, let us try and get them closer together let the, let us try and fuse them into a single core so, so that they can talk to each other really fast and do a lot of computation so that's where these uh, fused systems come into play like AMD has come up with this fusion processor. And then Intel came out with its uh, Sandy Bridge. So this uh, this actually this laptop that you see out here is actually one of the first fusion cores that have come out. So it actually has the integrated CPU and GPU on the same core out here, and so it's actually pretty neat. Uh, so the, uh, at the high level, at the architecture level, what does fusion mean? It means that on the same chip, basically, you put both <coughs> the CPU and GPU cores. They have the cache hierarchy. They have these buffers. And then there is this memory controller with which you talk to the same memory. And actually, if you go to details, GPU has its own memory. So now you're trying to have um, like one memory for both of them. And so you need to just uh, play around with this. So that way, they are like more t tightly integrated. So you can imagine this says, oh, take this pointer out here and from there execute. And GPU says, oh, OK, fine. I don't need any transfer of data. I have my data right there. So let me just start executing right, right away. So this reduces the whole. Um, uh, Latency lag between sending the sending the work and getting the races back and all that stuff, and this uh, and so moving forward we'll probably see a lot of these kinds of chips coming out. And uh, the other interesting thing is I didn't go into too much about power, uh, but uh, GPUs when it when it comes to simple computation, I guess GPUs are much more uh, power efficient compared to CPUs because they don't have all these com complex units trying to do all kinds of computation. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, so if you can actually have something that chooses which one to run the application on, you would probably get a really good uh, power performance solution. Right. So uh, what are the, this is a marketing slide, I apologize, but, <laughs> but I guess, uh, so what are the main benefits of Fusion uh, system? So at the end of the day, uh, GPU have this through, GPU, as I talked about, it's a highly throughput optimized solution, like many things running in parallel. It's very good for high computation density, and it's really good for high bandwidth kind of uh, things that need a lot of bandwidth. And on the, on the CPU side, if you want compute quality, like if you want to do like more complicated operations and instead of uh, floats, if you want to work on doubles and so on, CPUs are much better. And it's also really good for fine-grained computation and uh, for sequential optimization and so on. Uh, so these are obviously its negative sides that, you know, the positives of one are negative the other. Uh, the hope is that with a fusion system, you probably get all these strings, which is like value, power, and uh, hybrid computation. So basically, as you can see, they're like far away from each other. They're kind of getting integrated, and then slowly they're all one. So everybody lives happily ever after after that. So, so I think uh, I'll, I'll now move on to some interesting challenges and opportunities when it comes to this uh, whole area. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly, I in, I'll not try and bore you, but I'll just, I want to just give you a high level of like as to some couple of slides about the work I'm doing. So it gives you a flavor of what kind of uh, interesting research uh, and uh, product work is going on in the industry. So one of the things that you saw was that GPGPU execution model. Like, you know, you just say CPUs are good at sequential, GPUs are good at parallel execution. So I think one of the things to talk to think about is that both CPUs and GPUs are evolving, and they're going to actually going to get, you know, like doing they're getting closer to each other in some ways. Like GPU is getting more programmable on one side. On the other side, CPU is also getting more of the vector units I talked about briefly before and more cores. 
So, uh, with these things, what will happen is that you, you, at the end of the day, you want to have something, uh, a model that, that says, okay, these are the kind of devices that you have. Uh, and then you want to try and utilize the devices as best as you can, given an application, instead of thinking about, oh, okay, this would run good on the CPU, run it on the CPU. This would run good on the GPU, so run it on the GPU. So instead of the application programmer determining all this stuff, we want to have a way by which you automatically figure out, based on the application that you write, where to run what. So in that case, CPU is no longer a control node. It will become, uh, it's a full partner uh, execution node at that point. So, uh, I guess I just uh, just to show just to you know like motivate this a little further. Here is like the if you look at at a high level CPU and GPU uh, you know architectures. So both of them have some kinds of you know like cores and they have some kind of cache hierarchy and then they're connected to the memories. So if you actually look a little deeper, CPUs have these SSC or functional units and GPUs have these uh, you know like these huge uh, uh, huge set of uh, processing elements running in parallel. So, uh, so the idea is then to, uh, to, uh, to uh, actually, I don't want to go into these details out here about the kind of memories it has and stuff. So we came up with a way by which you can actually map all these memories and whatnot of the GPU on, you know, somehow on, there's a kind of correspondence, this local memory maps to the cache out here, these private memories map to the register file and so on. So once we made this kind of a mapping, then we could actually, came, we, we are in a position now to, um, to actually uh, you know, solve this kind of a problem. Basically, the idea is you have these uh, physics simulations, image processing, and other applications that you saw earlier. And then you have these heterogeneous systems that have CPUs and GPUs. I think this goes back to Hera VM that you were talking about. So the idea is to actually come up with this layer that kind of sits between the two. This is the whole software system that would take these applications and say, oh, OK, which one is a better place to run my application on for this part of the code, and then run it there, and then run the other part out there. There's some of the initial results are published in this conference out here, and I think there is a lot of interesting work moving forward in this uh, in that area because uh, you don't want the. I think at the end of the day, you want the applications to be simple, and you want most of the complexity of figuring out which device to send and everything to be hidden, um, to be hidden somewhere in the in the software layers. So that's one of the interesting areas of research, I would say. So I think that would be a good starting point to then, uh, visualize some of the other work that's going on. So for example, this is the Stanford Pervasive Parallelism Lab. Uh, they are doing a lot of this kind of work as well. So on the hardware side, they're you know, they're kind of dealing with all these kind of different types of cores, these SIMD cores, out of order cores. So these are basically CPUs and GPUs kind of stuff. Um, and then these are the layers that, that they kind of come up with these runtime systems that would basically kind of map to different kinds of devices. Uh, the other interesting thing that's happening is that they are trying to come up with these things called domain-specific languages. So uh, instead of having like one language like C or Java or anything that would actually people want to write in, why not have like one language per domain? It's not going to be as much a uh, language as in it's not like going to be another C or Java or something like that. It will probably be based on one of the existing syntax. will probably be one of the existing languages, but they'll they'll have more like. Uh, there are more libraries corresponding to that particular language. Um, so they'll, they'll have some enforcement. So, okay, so for example, if you're going to do something like a physics uh, simulation, then one of the things that is probably going to be really useful is to have matrix multiplication all the time. Right? So what would you do? You, instead of having, having somebody to say, declare two matrices and their multiplication and stuff, you'd probably have like a library call does matrix multiply, something like that. So once you have these kinds of uh, constructs in these languages, you can imagine these lower structures out here to be able to understand what they can do with it to best, uh, like if the matrix multiply, it knows how to spread the matrix, matrices between these different devices and then do it at the best possible manner as opposed to, you know, trying to do it, uh, trying to, as opposed to having the application writer figure out which part goes where and so on. So there, this is one more thing I would definitely recommend you guys go take a look because this is, uh, they're, they're coming up with a lot of these different, uh, uh, d d uh, they're called DSL, the Domain Specific Languages, and it's based on the Java framework. So it would be an interesting starting point to get a feel for where this kind of research is going. Um, uh, one of the other uh, main trends I wanted to uh, give you a quick heads up was about this whole thing is kind of moving towards, there are two, two things, as you all know, things are moving towards. One is mobile computing in terms of laptops and tablets that you guys are carrying around. And on the other side is... Um, uh, and the other side is like cloud computing when you have Facebooks and 
you know, like MySpaces and whatnot, where most of the data is actually present on the cloud. Sorry, yeah. Uh, what's better for mobile phones, GPUs or CPUs? Um, mobile phones, actually, they need some part of the graphics component for actually showing off the graphics side stuff. But you don't need really complex ones because you don't do a lot of processing there. On the CPU side, again, you need really simple cores because you don't do a lot of processing again. So a lot of these, so we talked about ARM as one of the companies that does that. For example, your iPhone has these, this ARM processor, which is a really simplistic uh, CPU kind of core, a really simple GPU core. So when you have these kinds of things. So I think with, with time, though, even these processors that are there, they are actually getting multi-core and so on. So the hope is that, um, I think that I'm going to touch upon this out here, too, is that this, this, this whole notion of uh, thin clients, right? You want to have your <coughs> client, which is essentially what you hold in your hand, as thin as possible so that you don't have to, you know, because it doesn't have to drain too much power and whatnot. You want to keep it as, uh, you know, you want to have it as much battery life. That's what you kind of target. Uh, but a lot of the, the computation then should actually move to the server side. So that is, you say, okay, I want to recognize these faces or something like that. You know, that's the command that the cell phone should send. And at the server end, you have like, thousands of photos and you know, everything stored, or millions, you know, millions of photos stored, and a picture that you just send once will actually get you know, like, computed at the background, and then you send back, okay, these are the links for which, which, uh, which was a match, for example, and so on. So that kind of computation is uh, going to be really popular. Here, I was, uh, when I meant mobile, I was talking a little bit more on the laptop and tablet side of things, mainly because it's, again, I'm talking about CPUs and GPUs, which are a little more on the complicated course. So on the server side, uh, you would have uh, you would have these kinds of specialized like you know these fusion cores, or you would have CPU and GPU cores that are actually going to bring a lot of these computations. And on the front end, though, you'd have these low power devices that we talked about. Uh, in the case of cloud companies, like you know, uh, this is one more major trend in terms of uh, you know like there is uh, this Facebook and others have so much amount of data. And you have the other examples are like some, there are so many websites and there is so much amount of sensitive data, like your traffic signals and whatnot, you have the sensor information. So huge amounts of data. You want to find ways to optimally get the right, um, you know, like get the right amount of data from these different, uh, you know, to access the right data, to make, to, you know, analyze it, and come up with all kinds of stuff. So again, this is all happening at the, at the back end, basically. So this distributed and parallel computing is one of the main areas which is evolving. And so this is the next logical step of evolution, a lot of the things I talked about. So I think I'll just end this talk uh, with saying a few things. One is that the CPUs and GPUs, their worlds are colliding. And note that they are actually pretty complementary to each other. So kind of putting them together makes it a really interesting uh, you know, uh, chip to play with when you want to do a lot of fine-grained communication between them and whatnot. Uh, the major problem is going to be from, uh, it's going to be uh, on the programming side. So I think one of the software people in the search came out, they said, oh, all the hardware people are doing is kind of screwing us more and more every year. So <laughs> this is, this is a pretty much one of the important reasons why you need to think more about what programming models to use and how to actually kind of do it the best <coughs> possible way. And yes, software is going to be one of the major focus, uh, especially when you guys graduate and so on. And this move towards mobile and cloud is obvious, and everybody needs to, I guess, cater their products both in terms of where they want to do research in and where <coughs> they want to you know, have companies do their products in, uh, in, in these spaces. And it's a very dynamic field, and it's and there are a lot of interesting problems to solve. It's a very systems area, so uh, I would highly encourage you to take a look at it and spend more time trying to do research on that. Thank you. Right, so physics, again, when you talk about uh, things like, um, again, I think I, I, I shouldn't say for all physics computations, GPUs are better. Think of it this way, right? Let's say you have an N body, uh, let's say you have particles that are colliding with each other, right? And then you have these, I don't know, Van der Waals forces and whatnot that's like one upon square root of R2 minus R1 whole square and all that stuff, right? So it's a big complicated mathematical equation. Now, GPUs have some, uh, on one side, they have some specialized unit, like I think they have some square root unit or something like that, that does these things like in a jiffy. And then the other side of thing is that they have so many, and if, you're, if you have like your, if the number of particles you have is like on millions, on the order of millions that are colliding with each other, you have these so many units that are there, out there, which can each 
kind of process like two at a time. And that way, on the CPU, on the other hand, there are just like, you know, like four cores that can try to do something. On GPUs, there are like hundreds or thousands of cores that can actually try and do very fast. So both these things kind of make, make it a really good uh, option. But on the other hand, uh, like there could be some physics computations which have, like, you know, which are really complicated, which are like, you know, if something happens, then do this. If something else happens, then do that. Then if you tell the GPU to do it, it's going to be like, OK, I give up. I'm going to be slower than the CPU. So it all comes down to the type of application. And that's why I think this whole middle layer of software I'm talking about is so important, because in that case, you could look at the application a little bit and say, oh, OK, this is probably a better fit for the CPU, not for the GPU. So why not just try it on the CPU, and so on. So. Yeah. Um, is AMD's graphics division still in uh, Canada, or is that yeah? So actually, the I well, I kind of work in the graphics division, even though I'm a CPU person in this uh, company out here. So it they have uh, um, they yeah, the, and Toronto is one of their centers. The next big center, well, I would actually this is the main center, I would say, because this is where all the like execs are. So okay. are the Sunnyvale center. So it has a okay. lot of graphics people there. Okay. Yeah, and. They are constantly hiring, so. <laughs> yeah. What are the performance increases do you see by adding more cache to the chip? And as as the wires that get longer and longer, is there some type of physical, you know, limit that there's not going to be a, an ability to add more cache to a chip, and then, you know, now you're going to have to go out of the processor. Uh, so it's two part, two two parts. You know okay. what I mean? Like how much how much performance are you going to get if you're going to be able to take that slow RAM and put it on the die? make uh, these operations faster grabbing. Uh, right, so you're, okay, on one side, I think you're talking about the increasing cache size like L2 and L3, is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, exactly. Right, so I think the, well, the whole idea of caching is twofold, right? One is that you want to you want to stop it from going outside the chip as much as possible, try to capture a lot of these things. And the main places where you can capture uh, things are where the applications have a lot of locality, whether in terms of spatial yeah. or temporal locality. So now, it's so, the benefit of adding caches comes down to the type of applications at the end of the day that you run. So if you're going to run applications that are just you know like streaming in and streaming out, like you want to have like a big video that streams in, you do something to it and you just write it out. There's no um, there's no like <coughs> reuse of any kind. So caching is just like you know you might as well just have some buffers that you know just as long as I have enough buffer space to hold on this, well you can send send it back. That's good enough. So the cache size then may not matter as much. But on the other hand, if you're going to do some like you know sign up graphs applications and so on, which which where you're going to have these you know like vertices that you're going to reuse for the next computation and so on, then these caches play a very big role. And so definitely the cache size is that's why, especially for running on your CPUs, you'll continue to see probably some increase. Like you already have like two MB, four MB caches, I guess, on the LG side. So that's going to continue. Oh, well, yeah. Last question. Um, so do you guys have anything like? That competes with NVIDIA's like Tesla because I was at supercomputing and it seemed like they were they were more on the supercomputing side. Than oh yeah, the, okay. So I think one of the things that uh, Tesla is the workstation uh, chip, I guess, from their side. Right. So uh, yeah, that is I think that that is uh, an emphasis on that workstation side that's going on right now on the in at AMD as well. So okay. you'll probably see more of it. Uh, I think conventionally, if you look at the processors themselves, I think like I don't know, I don't want to sound biased, but at least so uh, apparently every year one company produces chips that are much faster than the others and right, so on. Right. So like two years back it was NVIDIA, last year it was and AMD did that, and this year who knows. Right. So given that is the case, so uh, that's only one part of the whole uh, solution. The tougher problem is to do with software for these. And so NVIDIA has a head start in terms of its CUDA that it started right. off with. And so that's why in the server market, so it's very important for like AMD to compete very well to first of all make OpenCL, right. which is what it's, it has adopted, to be you know like used more. And first of all, and secondly, <coughs> make these chips and target towards that.
how more or less going like this where you'd be you'd have a profiler first you take the like, let's say we had byte codes you had a profiler and then you had a memory uh, controller outside the core and then it would sketch you have a real time scheduler and uh, 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 see what, what the lo low balancing is and then split it up into uh, its GPUs where it's testing real time you know what's going on and split up operations um, I think most of it is right, except the controller is usually on chip. Yeah. So we well, have it'd have one for the cache on chip. Uh, uh, uh. No, the memory controller is usually I mean, even for even for the DRAM is usually on chip. But anyway, I, th I think you're mixing the software and hardware here a little bit. Yeah. So profiler is mostly uh, I'm expecting you're talking about the software profiler that yeah. you actually run underneath your program and yeah. kind of profile and do stuff. Yeah. The profiler and scheduler are going to be working together. Yeah. Absolutely right. In terms yeah. of figuring out where to do it and stuff like that. Because right now I have a, I have a major matrix multiplication mm -hmm. program where I'm multiplying a two, two four by fours. So it doesn't make sense to put to, to open up a thread for it, but I also take three matrices and, and then multiply it. And at that point, it makes sense to do it. See, and it, there's no situation where it, the compiler can, or, or even the chip live can profile the code and understand, okay, we don't need it for this uh, matrix operation, but it looks like we're multiplying three or four matrices right here all at once. This deserves, you know, optimization. Right. Right. right, that's one aspect. The second aspect is that matrix multiply, for example. No. You can continue talking, but then you can Yeah. So, matrix multiply, for example, the matrices, when they are like huge, yeah. like you know, thousands and thousands yeah. of elements, that's when it makes sense to yeah. divide it up. Otherwise, if just a few elements, you might as well do it on the CPU. Yeah. yeah. Alright. Quick question: What's your so what's your educational background? Are you like do you have so any E or my, CS? Or yeah, I was in computer systems at Stanford. Oh. You know, Susan. I'm not sure actually. Susan. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So oh, we okay. went to school together. Oh, awesome. So okay. We both have very similar backgrounds. Okay, so so you were your EE then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I was in EE department, but mostly did CS stuff. Oh, so okay. it's like computer systems is like the layer that sits on top of all EE stuff, right, but right, does right. You know, understands hardware. Awesome. Okay, so <laughs> is it your undergrad and your graduate? Undergrad and graduate. Uh, oh. Undergrad was mostly CS. Yeah. Like oh, CS, okay. Yeah, I had CS undergrad. And, yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Ooh, I don't know what to do with this. I'm scared I'm going to break it. Oh, no. Oh, because oh, it's busted. Yeah. Oh, that was scary. Yeah. Hmm. How are you feeling? I've got the death call, but other than that, I'll
Okay, we want to finish with this. I don't think we got all the way through, right? Is there going to be swap relics again next week, too? Because I tried to print this out today. Yeah. I know. That is why. Uh, yeah, they'll get it fixed. created I created this blank one so you can sort of practice and so what we're working on we the only information that you need is the first two columns which is the production function input output input output <coughs> And the prizes. Now, notice there's, we're just working on table one where the prize is $21. Table two is change the price to 15, change the price, change the cost. Okay. Um, so you can practice with this, fill it out. Those of you, the other thing I've done that you'll be able to get to online. is for those of you who know Excel or those of you who don't know Excel, maybe you want to play around with it. Right? Because this is actually an important software program. By the time you get out of here, you should know how to use. Okay. Now, if you're in business, a lot of the business classes of upper division especially, you'll have to do this. Because right? uh, this is a way of analyzing quantitative data. So, um, you could play around and uh, with the Excel program, right? So, it's not a PDF. You can actually type in. So, marginal physical product, you would write, we would want to take 5 minus 0 gives us 5, or 12 minus 5 gives us 7. But don't write in the numbers, write in the cell. So, this is B6 minus B5, right? 